Uh, today I'm going to focus, uh, and, and indeed uh, in my final lecture in June, I'm going to focus on a younger generation of poets who were born in that decade of the 1790s um, and who came of age in the Regency period. But they all died before Coleridge and long before Wordsworth, who lived on to the age of 80 to 1850, uh, as, of course, by then a poet laureate, a Victorian, a Tory, a country gentleman, a huge influence on the culture of his age, but the author in the second half of his career of a very voluminous and tedious body of poetry. They all died before him. From the point of view of romantic glamour, there is a lot to be said for dying young which was, of course, the fate of the celebrated young romantics. Lord Byron, subject of uh, my lecture next month, born 1788, died of fever in a Greek swamp on his way to fight for freedom at the age of 36. Percy Bysshe Shelley, born the son of a baronet in 1792, drowned off the coast of Italy at the age of 30. In his pocket, a double-backed copy of the poems of my main figure today, John Keats born in humble circumstances in suburban London in 1795 and died of tuberculosis in Rome in 1821. At the very beginning of my first lecture, I made the point that when we think of the romantic artist, we tend to imagine the solitary genius, young, impoverished, perhaps drug fueled alone in his garret. I talked about the inspiration provided by the image of Thomas Chatterton, and I suggested that one of Joseph Seven's portraits of John Keats is an equally iconic example of the idea, Keats in solitary inspiration. But I went on to say that this was also a period where literary friendship and indeed co-authorship was a key theme. I'm interested in the Romantics as groups of author, not least because that is how they were labelled initially by their enemies. Wordsworth, Coleridge, and the now lesser-known figure of Robert Southey came to be called the Lake Poets. The term was coined as an insult, but eventually took hold as a compliment. The circle around John Keats were also given an, an insulting name that is now less well known to the general reader, the Cockney Poets. So before introducing the cast of players and going into the origin and the consequences of the Cockney label, I want to say a little more about this idea of literary collaboration. The obvious example is Lyrical Ballads, the collection of poems by Wordsworth and Coleridge that was published anonymously in 1798. Early readers were not made aware that this was a joint production. The advertisement at the beginning of the book speaks repeatedly of the author as if there were a single author. Successive sentences defending what Wordsworth, who wrote the preface, clearly thought were two poems in need of an apology, The Thorn and The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, refer to the author without any indication that these two ballads had different authors. We can perhaps see the beginning of the end of the friendship between Wordsworth and Coleridge with the relegation of the Ancient Mariner to the rear of the second edition uh, in, of the collection in 1800, which had an extra volume of poems entirely by Wordsworth and that gave full credit to him alone on the title page. The other key figure in Wordsworth's immediate circle was, of course, his sister Dorothy. And in an earlier lecture, I looked at the way in which she is introduced at the end of Tintin Abbey as the figure who restores Wordsworth to his unmediated relationship with nature. And, of course, Wordsworth's most famous poem was, in some sense, a collaboration with Dorothy. He didn't wander lonely as a cloud. He was walking with her, and she was the one whose acute eye gave her brother some key words and images. The image there is of Galbarrow Park by Lake Arleswater, where they walked. Dorothy's journals. We were in the woods beyond Galbarrow Park and we saw a few daffodils close to the waterside. We fancied the sea had floated the seeds ashore and a little colony had so sprung up. But as we went along, there were more and yet more. A long belt of them along the shore, the breadth of a country turnpike road. I never saw daffodils so beautiful. They grew among the mossy stones about and above them. Some rested their heads upon these stones as on a pillow for weariness, and the rest tossed and reeled and danced and seemed as they verily laughed with the wind that blew upon them over the lake. They looked so gay, ever glancing, ever changing. Those 
mossy stones provided inspiration for the description of the mysterious Lucy as a violet by a mossy stone. But the movement of the daffodils and their motion in harmony with the wind-lapping waves on the lake sowed the seeds for I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Wordsworth is only really alone in the act of recollection and memory at the end of the poem, for oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, that is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So now let's turn to an example of collaboration among the younger generation of romantics. Let's think for a moment about the origin of another of the most famous poems of the age. Have a listen to this. In Egypt's sandy silence all alone stands a gigantic leg which far off throws the only shadow that the desert knows. I am great Ozymandias, saith the stone, the king of kings. This mighty city shows the wonders of my hand. The city's gone, naught but the leg remains to disclose the sight of this forgotten Babylon. We wonder, and some hunter may express wonder like ours, when through the wilderness where London stood, Holding the wolf in chase, he meets some fragment huge and stops to guess what powerful but unrecorded race once dwelt in that annihilated place. Well, you might initially think that this is a rejected first draft of the sonnet by Percy Bysshe Shelley, with which you are surely familiar. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. In fact, the first poem is by a man called Horace or Horatio Smith. He was a friend whom Shelley praised for his generosity, observing that this was unusual for a stockbroker, Smith's profession. Uh, he was a li very liberal-minded banker. Smith spent Christmas 1817 with Shelley and his wife Mary, and they decided to have a little competition. Something similar happened around the same time when Shelley, Keats and Lee Hunt, whom we will meet in a moment, set themselves a task of writing a sonnet on the subject of the River Nile in 15 minutes flat. Keats's was not one of his more memorable works, but at least he finished on time. Lee Hunt overran by several minutes. But on this occasion, Smith and Shelley chose a passage from the ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus, which gave a vivid account of a giant statue of the Egyptian pharaoh Ramesses II, together with a quotation of the inscription at its base. King of kings, Ozymandias am I. If any want to know how great I am and where I lie, let him outdo me in my work. The theme then was the transience of empires, the hubris of those mighty rulers who, as it were, declare a thousand-year Reich. A much-discussed book at this time in the Shelley household was Volney's Ruins or Meditations on Revolutions and Empires. Shelley's wife Mary had made memorable use of this previous year. It is the volume in which Victor Frankenstein's creature, hiding in the woods, he picks it up, discovers it, and from it he gains an insight into the manners, governments, and religions of the different nations of the earth. Volney writes in that book, written during the revolutionary decade, of the fall of once mighty ancient empires, of the tyranny of the Catholic Church, and of the evil of men with wealth and power. 
He combined historical pessimism with revolutionary optimism, prophesying a day when the world would be reunited in a single religion of progressive rationality. From Percy Shelley's point of view, Volney provided a powerful contrast between the inevitability of the fall of kings, emperors and tyrants on the one hand, and the potential immortality of poets on the other. Poets, you will remember, Shelley extolled as the prophets of an as yet, un uh, as yet unapprehended future of liberty and justice. Well, of course, Shelley was a better poem than Smith, whose sonnet does not have a line that matches the memorability of look on my mighty works, ye, look on my works, ye mighty and despair. But this forgotten sonnet does offer a striking image of how the British Empire will one day go the way of the ancient Egyptian one, and perhaps how the monuments of this very city of London will become ruins witnessed by a wandering hunter in an age to come which perhaps with climate change and rising sea levels will come sooner rather than later. My point though, is that a great poem such as Shelley's Ozymandias, read in isolation or anthologized among a collection of greatest hits, really needs to be understood as coming from a specific context and being inspired by an occasion of what we might describe as poetic brotherhood or literary sociability. Both the Ozymandias poems were published in early 1818 in a magazine called The Examiner, edited by that man Lee Hunt. Shelley's appeared over the nom de plume Gil Rastes. They subsequently appeared in respective collections by Shelley and by Smith. The latter altered his title to the somewhat pedantic, on a stupendous leg of granite discovered standing by itself in the deserts of Egypt with the inscription inserted below. But let's think a little more about that memorable closing line of Shelley's. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Not the closing line, sorry, the, the uh, line halfway through the closing section. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Here is a letter written by John Keats to his friend, the artist, Benjamin Robert Hayden, just over a year earlier, on the day after another occasion of what I am calling literary sociability. There had been a glorious evening of conversation between Keats, Hayden, Lee Hunt, and other writers. And this is what Keats writes the next day to Benjamin Robert Hayden, November 20, 1816. My dear sir, last evening wrought me up, and I cannot forbear sending you the following. Yours unfeignedly, John Keats, removed to 76 Cheapside, Great spirits now on earth are sojourning. He of the cloud, the cataract, the lake, who on Helvellyn's summit, wide awake, catches his freshness from archangel's wing. He of the rose, the violet, the spring, the social smile, the chain for freedom's sake. And lo, whose steadfastness would never take a meaner sound than Raphael's whispering. And other spirits there are, standing apart, upon the forehead of the age to come. These, these will give the world another heart and other pulses. Hear ye not the hum of mighty workings in the human mart? Listen a while, ye nations, and be dumb. And Keats's final line, I find it hard not to hear in anticipation of Shelley's, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Keats's listen becomes Shelley's look. Keats's mighty workings from the previous line become Shelley's works. Keats's ye nations become Shelley's ye mighty. And decisively, Keats's and be dumb becomes Shelley's and despair. Keats's poem is about the great spirits of the present who will one day be recognised as immortals. Shelley's is about the great rulers of the past who have proved mortal, all too mortal. The politicians die and their monuments are broken. The creative artists live and influence the future through the endurance of their work. In this sense, Keats's poem inspires not just Ozymandias, but Shelley's vision of poets as the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Consider the poem's spirits standing apart upon the forehead of the age to come, one of whom presumably is Keats himself, self-effacing yet ambitious for his own art. That sense of poets being ahead of the curve, carved upon the face of the future, 
chimes with the climax of the defence of poetry that Shelley wrote sometime later. Poets are the higher offence of an unapprehended inspiration, the mirrors of the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present, the words which express what they understand not, the influence which is move not but moves. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. So who are the three great spirits singled out by Keats? The alleged inheritor of the art of Raphael is naturally a flattering reference to Haydn himself, who toiled at grand history paintings in the Renaissance style, among which would be his Christ's entry into Jerusalem, in which he included images of contemporary poets as figures in the crowd. And you can see Wordsworth here. And the profile of Keats behind Wordsworth, just there. Nor are there any prizes for guessing the identity of he of the cloud, the cataract, the lake, who on Helvellyn's summit, wide awake, catches his freshness from Archangel's wing. Cloud, cataract and lake are the words worthy and hallmarks. The reference to Helvellyn may be Keats's recollection of one of the poems on the naming of places in lyrical ballads where Helvellyn is mentioned. But it could also be that Hayden had shared with Keats the manuscript of a recent as yet unpublished Wordsworth poem. Wordsworth had recently visited Hayden, shown him some poems, which was to a, a woman uh, addressed to her on her first ascent to the summit of Helvellyn. It begins, inmate of a mountain dwelling, thou hast climbed aloft, and gazed from the watchtowers of Helvellyn, awed, delighted, and amazed. The image of Wordsworth on the summit of Helvellyn certainly impressed itself on Benjamin Robert Hayden. Years later, in 1842, not long before he committed suicide, he would execute the most famous of his paintings, of his portraits, the portrait of Wordsworth wrapped in contemplation on Helvellyn. Wordsworth famously returned to the summit of Helvellyn on the occasion of his 70th birthday in 1840. And I hope in 10 years' time when I'm 70, I'll do the same. Well, this sonnet was not Keats's first poem in praise of a fellow practitioner of creative art, a phrase that Wordsworth used in a sonnet he dedicated to Hayden. The first poem Keats shared with anybody was a sonnet that he showed to his schoolmaster, Charles Cowden Clark, the previous year, entitled, Written on the Day that Mr. Lee Hunt Left Prison. It begins with an image of Lee Hunt in prison. He's been put there for showing truth to flattered state. Keats then claims that the liberty of Hunt's immortal spirit, as free as the sky-searching lark, could never be constrained. In his poetry, says Keats, Lee Hunt broke through the stone walls of his prison, roamed in the halls and bowers fair of Spencer's fairy queen, culling enchanted flowers, and flew with daring Milton through the fields of air. Setting up the theme of the immortality of artists in opposition to the ephemerality of politicians, the sonnet ends with a contrast between Hunt's future fame and the death of the wretched crew of those in government. <laughs> Lee Hunt's poetic signature was indeed a liberal scattering of flowers and a diction that owes much to Spencer and Milton. He's very keen on flowers. His sister-in-law, Elizabeth Kent, a very interesting writer in her own right, would, uh, would later publish an excellent guide to contain a gardening for city dwellers without gardens of their own. Flora Domestica, or the portable flower garden, with directions for the treatments of plants and pots and illustrations from the works of the poet. She was a particular admirer of the Northamptonshire peasant poet, John Clare, not least because he actually knew his botany, whereas her brother-in-law's flower poetry was shaped more by his readings in ancient mythology and the poetic tradition. Keats's lines then in the sonnet to Hayden, he of the rose, the violet, the spring, the social smile, the chain for freedom's sake, are accordingly a reference to Lee Hunt. Keats's schoolmaster Clark had introduced him to the paper that Lee Hunt edited with his brother, the paper in which Ozymandias would soon be published. Published weekly under the title The Examiner, this was the magazine that had caused the imprisonment 
and that would give Keats his first break, that would shape his, the writers in his circle into a group, and that would lead to the term Cockney Poets. Lee Hunt and his brother John launched the paper in 1808, taking the title of The Examiner from a magazine produced by Jonathan Swift and his fellow Tories a century before, though coming now from the opposite end of the political spectrum. The aim, says Lee Hunt in his prospectus, was to assist in producing reform in Parliament, liberality of opinion in general, especially freedom from superstition, and a fusion of literary taste into all subjects whatsoever. Freedom from superstition was code for religious scepticism. Hunt would make himself unpopular with conservatives by peopling his poems with pagan gods and even writing a mini epic called The Story of Rimini that glorified the adulterous couple Paolo and Francesca whom Dante had placed in the second circle of hell. But the magazine was also full of politics as well as poetry. Within months of its first issue, it was prosecuted for publication of an article entitled Military Depravity, which attacked the corrupt, bribery-ridden system of promotions in the army. It was regarded as dangerously seditious to say anything negative about the armed forces at the height of the Peninsular War. The case was dropped, but another one ensued a couple of years later, when the Hunt brothers weighed in under the title 1,000 Lashes on the practice of flogging soldiers for minor disciplinary infractions. This time, they were found not guilty of seditious libel, thanks to a powerful case for the defence mounted by the lawyer Henry Broom. But in 1811, it was third time lucky for the Attorney General, when, provoked by an article in the Morning Post that praised the newly anointed Prince Regent as an Adonis in loveliness, the examiner noted that George, I should have put in a slide of him here, but you can imagine what he was like, the examiner noted that George was actually a corpulent gentleman of 50, who moreover was a violator of his word, a libertine over head, ears, head and ears in debt and disgrace, a despiser of domestic ties, the companion of gamblers and demireps, a man who has just closed half a century without one single claim on the gratitude of his country or the respect of posterity. This cost the Hunt brothers their two years sentence in separate prisons, though Lee Hunt didn't have a bad time as he decked out his cell with flowers and continued to edit the paper from behind bars. Some months into his sentence, the news was announced that following the death of the poet, the poet laureate, Henry James Pye, possibly the worst versifier ever to hold the office, a successor had been appointed in the form of Robert Southey, friend of Wordsworth and Coleridge, who back in the early 1790s had written an inflammatory play called Watt Tyler that welcomed the French Revolution. The Prince Regent had originally wanted Walter Scott for his laureate, best-selling poet of the age, but Scott shrewdly recognised that the post would prove a poisoned chalice and nominated instead his friend Southey, who needed the money. More news about the Lake Poets came in that same year of Hunt's imprisonment. William Wordsworth, the man who had welcomed the revolution with the words, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive and to be young was very heaven, had been appointed distributor of stamps for the county of Westmoreland. His job was to oversee the sending out of stamps to post offices in the region and the imposition of impressed duty stamps, a tax on legal transactions, such as insurance policies and the preparation of documents that could be used in court. Of course, we're still familiar today with stamp duty when we buy a house. The position gave Wordsworth financial security in the form of a salary of £400 a year for not very much work but the opprobrium of the younger romantics for his acceptance of an office of the establishment, a sinecure dished out by his patron, the Tory landowning coal magnate Lord Lonsdale. Southey as laureate and Wordsworth as purveyor of the royal head on the stamps were now in the service of that corpulent gentleman of 50, the regent. Coleridge, meanwhile, had started writing for the right-wing press, which they regarded as not much better. In order to respond to these turncoats, the literary world needed a new injection of liberal talent, and the examiner was the vehicle to provide it. In the spring of 1814, the paper hired a new columnist. William Hazlitt, my favourite prose writer in the English language, was the son of a dissenting minister who had tried his hand at philosophy, parliamentary reporting and painting, but found his métier as a reviewer, essayist, political journalist and public lecturer. 
He'd been inspired to become a writer by hearing Coleridge preach and then staying with Wordsworth and Coleridge in the West Country when they were composing lyrical ballads, a visit memorably captured in his great essay, My First Acquaintance with Poets. Unlike the poets he so admired, Hazlitt had remained a radical ever since his youth in the 1790s. He saw Napoleon as the sword arm of revolution and freedom, not its extinguisher. Now in The Examiner, he attacked the establishment on three fronts in some of the most scintillating English prose ever written. One of his first contributions was a pair of essays on Hogarth's series of paintings, Marriage a la Mode, which exposed the hypocrisy, avarice and sexual depravity of the upper classes. Then there was a two-part review of the newly arrived actor, Edmund Keane. It was, it was really Hazlitt who made Keane's name. Keane played the part of Iago in Othello in a way which suggested, said Hazlitt, that the love of power, which is another name for the love of mischief, is natural to man. And then after this, he produced the first review, lengthy in three parts, of Wordsworth's recently published epic poem, The Excursion. It began by speaking of Wordsworth's great power of intellect, lofty conception and gift, almost preternatural gift for the poetic sublime. However, although the poem was much praised as a philosophical poem, Hazlitt was troubled that the way that Wordsworth always seems to be writing about himself, his own thoughts are his real subject. A seed was sown there for a distinction that Keats would make, having heard William Hazlitt give public lectures, public lectures in London, perhaps not unlike these, when Keats made a distinction between what he called, two wonderful phrases, the egotistical sublime of Wordsworth and the negative capability of Shakespeare. And there's a germ here too for Byron's damning of Wordsworth's egotism in his poem Don Juan that I'll talk about next time. Similarly, a major sequence of Hazlitt's review uh, looks at a, a, a long section of Wordsworth's excursion where a character called the Solitary, who's clearly partly based on Wordsworth himself, goes into disillusionment over the French Revolution. And this becomes an opportunity for Hazlitt to attack Wordsworth for his political apostasy, his shift to the right. Hazlitt takes Wordsworth's famous immortality ode and turns it back on the poet by reanimating a sense of his own and Wordsworth's youthful joy at the revolution. This is Hazlitt at his best, I think. The quote is from Wordsworth's great immortality ode. But though we cannot weave over again the airy, unsubstantial dream which reason and experience have dispelled, what though the radiance which was once so bright be now forever taken from our sight, though nothing can bring back the hour of glory in the grass, of splendour in the flower, yet we will never cease nor be prevented from returning on the wings of imagination to that bright dream of our youth, that glad dawn of the day star of liberty, that springtime of the world in which the hopes and expectations of the human race seemed opening in the same gay career with our own when France called her children to partake her equal blessings beneath her laughing skies, when the stranger was met in all her villages with dance and festive songs in celebration of a new and golden era, and when, to the retired and contemplative student, the prospects of human happiness and glory were seen ascending like the steps of a Jacob's ladder in bright and never-ending succession. What is impressive about Lee Hunt, Hazlitt and Keats is that even as they deplored the turn in Wordsworth's politics, they continued to see the strength in his poetry. Keats said that he regarded Wordsworth's excursion, Hayden's paintings and Hazlitt's criticism as the three things to rejoice at in the modern world. Keats made his own appearance in The Examiner by way of a sonnet to Solitude in May 1816, his first published poem. More of his poems were included as the months passed. And in December, Lee Hunt wrote a piece called Young Poets, in which he introduced both Shelley and Keats to the public, praising them to the skies. Then the Great Spirits sonnet to Hayden, with its reciprocal praise of Hunt and its glorying in Wordsworth's Mountain Muse, appeared in spring 1817. So it was entirely because of Lee Hunt that Keats became a published poet. In that same year of 1817, his first full-length volume was published, simply entitled Poems, and the examiner was quick to review it. Right, 
we get onto the rough stuff now. The association with Hunt had unfortunate consequences. In October 1817, a bolt came from the blue in the form of an anonymous diatribe signed Z in the right-wing Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine. It was entitled On the Cockney School of Poetry. While the whole critical world is occupied with balancing the merits, whether in theory or in execution, of what is commonly called the Lake School, it is strange that no one seems to think it necessary to say a single word about another new school of poetry which has of late sprung up among us. This school has yet not, I believe, as yet received any name, but if I may be permitted to have the honour of christening it, it may henceforth be referred to by the designation of the Cockney School. Its chief doctor and professor is Mr Lee Hunt, a man certainly of some talents, of extravagant pretensions, both in wit, poetry and politics, and with all of exquisitely bad taste and extremely vulgar modes of thinking and manners in all respects. He is a man of little education. Why Cockney, other than to provide a London name to contrast with the Lake School of the rural north? Well, the word was, of course, the nickname given to the citizens of London or persons born within the sound of Bow Bell. This was a full-scale assault on the grounds of class. Great poets, it is said by Zed, have always been country gentlemen. He sneers at the false represent representation of nature in these upstart urban and suburban writers. All the great poets of our country have been men of some rank in society. Oh, really? And there is no vulgarity in any of their writings. But Mr Hunt cannot utter a dedication or even a note without betraying the shibboleth of low birth and low habits. He is the ideal of a cockney poet. He raves perpetually about green fields, jaunty streams and er-arching leafiness, exactly as a cheapside shopkeeper does about the beauties of his box on the Camberwell Road. Mr Hunt is altogether unacquainted with the face of nature in her magnificent scenes. He has never seen any mountain higher than Highgate Hill, nor reclined by any stream more pastoral than the Serpentine. Hunt was also attacked on the grounds of irreligion and lack of patriotism. And then there was his unhealthy interest in sex. The extreme moral depravity of the Cockney School is another thing which is forever thrusting itself upon the public attention and convincing every man of sense who looks into their productions that they who sport such sentiments can never be great poets. How could any man of higher original genius ever stoop publicly at the present day to dip his fingers in the least of those glittering and rancid obscenities which float on the surface of Mr Hunt's hippocrine? His poetry resembles that of a man who has kept company with kept mistresses. His muse talks in depth delicately like a tea-sipping milliner girl. Some excuse for her there might have been had she been hurried away by imagination or passion, but with her, indecency seems a disease. She appears to speak unclean things from perfect inanition. Surely there are those who are connected with Mr Hunt by the tender relations of society have good reasons to complain that his muse should have been so prostituted. In Rimini, that's his poem about Paolo and Francesca, a deadly wound is aimed at the dearest confidences of domestic bliss, the point being that um, Fran uh, Francesca, has a, and Paola, Francesca has an affair with Paola's brother. Um, the author has voluntarily chosen a subject not of simple seduction alone, one in which his mind seems absolutely to gloat over, with all the details of adultery and incest. According to the Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, published in 1811, the interpretation of the word cockney is a young person coaxed or conquered, made wanton, or a nestle cock, delicately bred and brought up, so as when arrived at man's estate, to be unable to bear the least hardship. So those implications of both sexual profligacy and effeminacy served Zed's damaging purposes very well indeed. And so it was not only because of London origins, but because of those connotations that the name Cockney was chosen. A subsequent essay in the same series, there was a series of six essays attacking the Cockneys, raised the temperature still further. Our hatred and contempt of Lee Hunt is not so much owing to these and other causes as to the odious and unnatural harlotry of his polluted muse. We were the first to brand with a burning eye on the false face of this kept mistress of a, of a demoralising incendiary. We tore off her gaudy veil and transparent drapery and exhibited the painted cheeks and writhing limbs of the prostitute. 
Wordsworth, meanwhile, was reclaimed for the political right. I'm not going to read all this passage. You can read it in the transcript at the end. But the basic point is how such an indelicate writer as Mr Hunt can pretend to be an admirer of Mr Wordsworth is to us a thing altogether inexplicable. For the person who writes Rimini to admire the excursion is just as impossible as it would be for a Chinese polisher of cherry stones or a gilder of teacups to burst into tears at the sight of the Theseus or the torso. The torso is a reference to a very famous sculpture of the Belvedere torso. Well, inevitably, it was only a matter of time before Keats was caught in the crossfire. Another Tory newspaper, William Gifford's Courtly Review, picked up the Cockney moniker and published an excoriating review by John Wilson Croker of Keats's romance Endymion in April 18. It is not that Mr Keats, if that be his real name, for we almost doubt that any man in his senses would put his real name to such a rhapsody, it is not, we say, that the author has not powers of language, rays of fancy and gleams of genius. He has all these but he is unhappily a disciple of the new school of what has been somewhere called Cockney poetry, which may be defined to consist of the most incongruous ideas in the most uncouth language. A few months later, Blackwoods rubbed salt in the wound. How dare a mere trainee apothecary write poetry? Medical metaphors are cruelly applied. Whether Mr John had been sent home with a diuretic or composing draught to some patient far gone in the poetical mania, we have not heard. This much is certain, that he has caught the infection, and that thoroughly. For some time we were in hopes that he might get off with a violent fit or two, but of late the symptoms are terrible. Zed goes on to attack. Keats' his recently published Long Romance, his poem Endymion. The frenzy of the poems, the volume published the previous year, was bad enough, but it did not alarm us half so seriously as the calm, settled, imperturbable, drivelling idiocy of Endymion. Then he gets into full stride with an assault on the Great Spirit's sonnet to Hayden that I've been talking about. The absurdity of the thought in this sonnet, if possible, is surpassed, is surpassed in another addressed to Hayden, the painter, that clever but affected artist, who as little resembles Raphael in genius as he does in person, notwithstanding the foppery of having his hair curled over his shoulders in the old Italian fashion. In this exquisite piece, it will be observed, Mr Keats classes together Wordsworth, Hunt and Hayden as the three greatest spirits of the age, and that he alludes to himself and some others of the rising brood of Cockney as likely to attain hereafter an equally honourable elevation. Wordsworth and Hunt, what a juxtaposition. The purest, the loftiest, and we do not fear to say it, the most classical of living English poets, join together in the same complement with the meanest, the filthiest, and the most vulgar of cockney poetasters. A passage of protest against tyranny in the third book of Endymion leads Zed to add, we'd almost forgot to mention that Keats belongs to the cockney school of politics as well as the cockney school of poetry. In his poem Adonius, an elegy on the death of John Keats, Shelley went so far as to imply, as others among Keats's friends explicitly said, that these assaults were the cause of Keats's death. Our Adon Adonais has drunk poison. Oh, what deaf and viperous murderer could crown life's early cup with such a draught of woe. The poem goes on to demand that the nameless worm who wrote the attacks in Blackwoods should now itself disown. Shelley voices a splendid curse. Live thou, whose infamy is not thy fame. Live, fear no heavier chastisement from me, thou noteless blot on a remembered name. But be thyself and know thyself to be, and ever at thy season be thou free to spill thy venom when thy fangs are flow. Remorse and self-contempt shall cling to thee. Hot shame shall burn upon thy secret brow, and like a beaten hound tremble thou shalt as now. But then the poem turns beautifully to the idea of Keats's poetic immortality. He has outsoared the shadow of our night, envy and calumny and hate and pain. Shelley does not imagine the dead poet's afterlife in terms of the heavenly bliss of orthodox Christianity. This, remember, was a man who was sent down from Oxford for writing a pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism. Immortality comes instead to Keats in the form of a reunion with nature, he is a portion of the loveliness which once he made more lovely. 
He is made one with nature. There is heard his voice in all her music from the moan of thunder to the song of night's sweet bird. He is a presence to be felt and known in darkness and in light from herb and stone, spreading itself where'er that power may move which has withdrawn his being to its own, which wields the world with never wearied love, sustains it from beneath and kindles it above. The inclusion of night's sweet bird, the nightingale, is an especially delicate touch, a nod to the most musical of Keats's odes. Keats was deeply wounded by the attacks in Blackwoods, but it cannot really be said that he was killed by his bad reviews. He was killed by tuberculosis. It might even be suggested that the constant harping on his association with the Cockney style led him to rid his poetry of Lee Huntisms and find the mature style that he achieved in 1819, the breathtaking year of productivity that produced the Odes and the Fall of Hyperion. But the Cockney poet's controversy did prove fatal for another man. John Scott was a close associate of Lee Hunt. He started his career editing another paper for him. And in January 1820, as the influence of the examiner was waning, he launched a new monthly, the London Magazine. He worked indefatigably, writing about a third of the paper himself, giving a new platform to Hazlitt, and providing a forum for two other great London-based prose writers, Thomas de Quincey and Charles Lamb. The former's Confession of an, Confessions of an English Opium Eater and the latter's Essays of Elia were first published in serial form in the London. John Scott's editorials began to attack the vulgar slander of Zed in Blackwoods. What kind of artistic judgment, he asked, was being shown in references to Hayden's greasy hair or the fact that Keats had walked the hospitals as a trainee apothecary? In November 1820, he launched a full-scale assault in a long article headed Blackwoods magazine. It was a poisonous infection, a threatening plague, the most foul and livid spot, an accursed taint in the literature of the day. Scott dared to use a word loaded with risk. The honour of the literature of the present day we consider now at stake. In particular, he pointed to his namesake, the great Sir Walter Scott, who had connections to the Tory Blackwood Circle in Edinburgh. And he demanded that the brightest ornament of his country's modern literary history should be cleared of a diseased, false, affected, profligate, whining and hypocritical character by means of a clear announcement as to the identity of Zed that would ensure public knowledge that Sir Walter was not implicated. There was no response from Edinburgh. So in the next issue, John Scott upped his game. Another article accused Blackwoods of infamy, cowardice, selfishness, stupidity, antisocial enormities, insensibility, insensitivity, spite, treachery, malignity, Iscariot treachery and Iago malice. He set his sight on the contributor and co-editor Christopher North, a pseudonym for the minor late poet John Wilson, who having earlier eulogised Wordsworth in both poetry and prose, was now libelling him. Naturally, John Scott also sprang to the defence of Keats, letting it be known how profoundly the young poet, who was by now at death's door, had been affected by the Cockney School essays. On Wednesday the 10th of January 1821, John Scott received a call from a gentleman acting on behalf of J.G. Lockhart, whom everyone in the literary world suspected, correctly, was Zed. Only a year older than Keats, Lockhart had been a brilliant student. Too good for school, he was sent to Glasgow University at the age of 12, became Snell Exhibitioner at Balliol College, Oxford at 14, took a first-class degree in greats at 19, met Goethe in a continental tour, and returned to Edinburgh to a culture dominated by Francis Jeffrey's Whig Edinburgh Review, and where he set up Blackwoods as a Tory rival, with the support of Sir Walter Scott, whose biography he would write, and whose daughter he married at exactly the time the Cockney controversy blew up. John Scott of the London had named Lockhart as an understood though unavowed conductor of Blackwood's magazine. Lockhart's London friend, a Mr Christie, now asked if he, John Scott, was the author of the articles in the London attacking Blackwood's. Lockhart, said Christie, considered them to be offensive to his feelings and injurious to his honour, that key word, honour. Scott said he would only answer if... Lockhart would answer as to whether he was the editor of, Black, of, of, of Blackwoods. The gentleman came back and said that Lock, Lockhart didn't intend to commence legal proceedings, but wanted a public apology. 
Scott held his ground. He asked whether Lockhart was acting as a gentleman assailed in his honourable feelings by the indecent use of his name in print, or as a professional scandalmonger who has long profited by fraudulent and cowardly concealment. Another letter came via the intermediary from Lockhart, demanding an apology and alluding to the other alternative. The correspondence went on, letters to and fro, neither man backing down. It was the end of the road. They were ill met by moonlight on the night of Friday the 16th of February 1821 in a wooded knoll on Primrose Hill, not far from the Chalk Farm Tavern, where John Scott had left a third of a bottle of wine, saying that he would return to finish it later. The pistols were primed and the seconds consulted. Both men fired. Both missed. The seconds should have declared that honour had been duly satisfied. But Christie's second, Christie the intermediary from Lockhart, his second, a man called James Trail, was a stickler for the etiquette of the duel. And dueling was by this time illegal, which is why they were meeting at night. Christie had deliberately missed Scott, whereas Trail claimed that Scott had taken aim at Christie. For honour to be satisfied, satisfied, there would have to be a second shot on equal terms. They fired. Scott took the ball below his ribs. It passed through into his stomach. The attending surgeon took one look at the wound and fled. Anybody involved could have been taken to court. One, uh, a man, one of the other three men, one of the seconds, went back to the tavern um, and they got a door and uh, carried Scott back to the tavern on the door and then the rest of them all ran away to avoid arrest. Scott's family were called. He lay in the tavern, his family watching over, together with their family doctor, a wonderful man called George Darling, who was also the doctor to John Keats and indeed to John Clare. Darling managed to remove the bullet from the abdomen. There was hope for a few days, but then Scott's fever returned and he died in the night seven days after the duel. Blackwood seems to have been unrepentant. A poem in the April issue, in praise of Lockhart's fellow editor Christopher North, spoke of gruff-looking Zed, wet with the blood of the Cockneys. Lockhart himself allegedly fell into depression as the result of the affair, and he would soon leave the paper and become editor of that other Tory journal, the Quarterly Review. And what of Keats? All through that January and February of 1821, as literary crossfire escalated towards real bullets, he lay desperately ill in Rome. His stomach, like Scott's, was ruined, but in his case, due to the ravages of his illness. He asked for a bottle of opium to kill himself. He would write in a letter, I shall soon be laid in the quiet grave. Thank God for the quiet grave. Oh, I can feel the cold earth upon me, the daisies growing over me. Oh, for this quiet, it will be my first. He died at 11pm on February the 23rd, four nights before the editor who had defended the honour of the Cockneys. They laid him to rest in the English Protestant cemetery. Keats supposedly wanted nothing but some enigmatic words on the gravestone. Here lies one whose name was writ on water, a suggestion of being forgotten, not of living as he had said that he hoped in the sonnet to Hayden and in one of his letters where he spoke of being among the English poets after my death. But his friends chose instead, and later regretted, words that allude to the wounding articles in Blackwoods and the Quarterly. The words are still there today. This grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet who on his deathbed, in the bitterness of his heart, at the malicious power of his enemies, desired these words to be engraven on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. Keats's last poem, meanwhile, was a fragment, its wrenching, mysterious voice, anything but vulgar, affected or cockney. It sounds as if it is addressed to a lover who has rejected the poet in the manner of John Donne's The Apparition, where the poet imagines his own ghost returning to haunt an unfaithful lover. It could be a fragment from a projected drama in the Jacobean style. It could be aimed at Fanny Braun. But might it also be a magnanimous reaching out to those cruel reviewers, Croker and Lockhart, an appeal to their consciences, a very gentlemanly, far from Cockney, holding out for a handshake of reconciliation 
from beyond the grave to which he knew he was going. This living hand, now warm and capable of earnest grasping, would, if it were cold and in the icy silence of the tomb, so haunt thy days and chill thy dreaming nights that thou would wish thine own heart dry of blood, so in my veins red life might stream again and thou be conscience calm. See, here it is. I hold it towards you. Thank you.